Um, actually, I read an article on CNN which said quite the opposite. Um, and I'll show that to you in a few seconds. But for me, so I'm not quite a baby. I, um, I wasn't using the internet when I was two years old, like this picture shows. But I definitely can't imagine a world without laptop computers. It's hard for me to comprehend not being able to have internet and email and the instant communications that gives you. And I definitely cannot exist in a world without calculators. There's just no <laughs> way I'm going to be calling out this about calculator. It's not happening. <laughs> so I read an article on CNN, and the ones I mentioned, which said that 82% of children in 10 Western countries have a digital footprint before the age of two. My little uh, mathematically correct diagram that I made there actually cut off the legs of one of the stick figures to make the 2%. And it's not just about our digital footprint either, it's about the roads that we now share. How did people get their news 30, 40 years ago? Probably through like, newscasts on uh, TV or on the radio. And while millions of people still watch those nightly newscasts, increasingly our news is coming from other avenues. We can get our news on our favorite blogs, through our Facebook wall, or through Twitter feeds. And sometimes these avenues can provide even more news than the conventional ones would. If some of you remember the protests in Iran, then you will also remember that a lot of the citizen journalism came from people in Iran who were tweeting, who were sending emails, uh, and really using the internet to an extent. This was something that wouldn't have happened 20, 30 years ago. These are becoming the eyewitness reports, if you will, of the 21st century. And whatever you pin it down to, technology or not, the differences between someone born decades before me and myself are immense. And you can hear it sometimes in complaints, too. Old people don't know how to use anything. Young people don't know how to do anything for themselves without the help of technology. Old people are so set in their ways. Young people try to change just for the sake of trying new things. Old people are too conservative. Young people are too liberal. These are just a few of these stereotypes about old and young and liberal, oh, sorry, in relative terms, of course, that we think about on a daily basis. Maybe you complain, oh, kids nowadays. Sometimes it's possible that you would think that with all the noise young people make, I want this, I want that, the kids are best seen and not heard. But I want you to imagine a situation. Think back to the last time you went out for a coffee with a friend, or maybe you had lunch, or you were discussing something with your colleagues, it could be whatever. Well, uh, or having a meeting with your boss, although I yeah, think about it, probably you guys are the boss. <laughs> but now imagine that in each one of your situations, that whoever you're talking with is the only one talking and in a very, very condescending voice as well. The reason that I'm asking you to imagine this is because in too many cases, this is what an average adult-child relationship looks like. You know what I mean, sending the kids off to another room while the adults talk about literature, current events, asset management, just do that as possible. Um, because goodness me, they have poor little children exposed to high culture. Or maybe not bother and ask the 10-year-old's opinion of local architecture, because really, what's the chance they'll say anything meaningful? I'm sure that many of you are very good parents and grandparents, and this scenario may not apply to everyone in the room. But many of us have seen such scenarios played out accidentally in our own homes. My sister Adriana, who was just playing, um, is a good case in point. Sometimes she has a few titles. Sometimes she'll say, oh, no one hears me. And the unfortunate thing is it's true, because Sometimes we kind of overlook her, and she'll point out something meaningful, only to have my mom say it a second later, and she'll be like, okay, you guys did hear me. It's done unconsciously a lot of times. It's not so much that you're turning your back and plugging your ears, it's more that some don't necessarily know how to listen. My mom is famous, well, infamous, among my older sister's high school friends, for whenever they come over to our house, you sit down at our table, and it will be questioned. Are you an honors? What do you think of teachers? Do you have technology? What do you see bullying? <laughs> Whatever it is, uh, right away. And sometimes it can get a little embarrassing <laughs> when you have friends over and the questions start uh, coming. But it can be, in the right place, quite good. A lot of adults aren't used to asking kids questions about different issues in society or whatever it may be. But by asking those questions, they're giving us good practice. And one of the reasons that I am the way I am today and the reason that I've been able to do quite a bit is because my parents talked with us like peers. They asked us for our opinion. So um, as a case of point, Priya and Maya were planning committee members on the TEDx event that I organized, TEDx Redmond. And one time we were at their house, and my mom started asking them some questions about their experience in school, their opinions on religion and society and all kinds of big issues. And both had some very profound answers to my mom's questions. Their mom had tears in her eyes because she hadn't realized that they had such ideas and opinions and that potential. Um, 
And this story demonstrates that even some very well-educated, great parents don't automatically know, hey, I should ask my kids questions. And that's why their mom was so emotional when she heard her kids share their opinions. So what's the big deal about listening is probably the response. It won't hurt anyone in the long run, will it? We'll grow up and then we can ever say. But my opinion is this. As we grow up, we become influenced by peer pressure, by what society tells us to do, what other people think. And as a result, we may become more gloomy or more used to thinking inside the box as we grow. And ultimately, when adults don't embrace what they can learn from us, when they send us out of a room, don't bother asking our opinion, they are rendering you our voices, and they are closing their eyes to potentially great ideas. It is, to speak in more industrial terms, wasting a valuable natural resource. I was on the home stretch program on CBC Radio yesterday. Are any of you familiar with the program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see some nodding. Um, and so the host, Davy Gray, asked me to play the part of skeptic, and I was like, well, what exactly can adults learn from kids? What can I learn from someone like you? What can adults who've lived through war and peace and seen the last few decades and had all, have all this experience, what can they learn from a bunch of youngsters who are just coming out of the cradle? Well, aside from being a conscience by making you feel guilty for spending millions of dollars and warming the planet, etc., <laughs> then I think that many of us can also show you a level of fearlessness, honesty, and creativity that some adults can only envy. But that, uh, that saying about old dogs can't learn new tricks, I think it was proof false in a study, which means that many of you, too, can have those qualities or think you have them already. Perhaps one of the first things that came to my mind when I thought about what adults can learn from young people uh, was about honesty, and the emperor's new clothes came to mind. Maybe you've heard it, which I'm um, sure you have. Wasn't it a child who finally pointed out that the emperor had no clothes on? So the short quote. So now the emperor walked through the streets, and all the people standing by and those at the windows cried out, Oh, how beautiful are our emperor's new clothes. In short, no one would allow that he could not see these much admired clothes, because in doing so, he would have declared himself either simpleton or unfit for his office. Certainly, none of the emperor's various suits had never made so great an impression as these invisible ones. But the emperor has nothing at all on, said a little child. Listen to the voice of innocence, exclaimed his father, and what the child had said was whispered from one to another. But he has nothing at all on, at last cried out all the people, and the emperor was vexed, he knew they were right, and the procession asked to go on, and the lords of the bedchamber took greater pains than ever to appear holding out the train, although in reality there was no train to hold. <laughs> Maybe the moral of Hans Christian Andersen's beloved childhood story was not just about conformity and flattery and deception as it was about adults listening to kids. You never know. We've all seen examples of blunt honesty from kids before. One of my fondest childhood memories, and my sister is trying to censor me on this because it's embarrassing, but we got this new tutor uh, named, uh, named Felisa, and she came over and she was teaching in Spanish, and my sister looked at her and kind of commented, and she was like, you have a big nose. Okay, maybe not the greatest thing to say. Um, and I wouldn't have dreamed of saying that out loud. And she did, did apologize afterward, realizing how stupid it was to say that. Um, and and that, am I advocating that kids should be allowed to say whatever they want, whether it's good or big nose or whatever it is, whether or not it's impolite or hurtful? No. But there's a big difference between impolite and the lying, flattering, and sucking up that we see so often. <laughs> <laughs> Front the truth. I'm not saying this is exclusive to adults. I mean, I think it happens really throughout stages of life. But I've seen a lot recently um, evidence with the spill in the Gulf of Mexico when BP's barrels of oil leaked us and it just kept on growing and growing. You know, are you really telling the truth in China? Even with these huge numbers, it was sort of like, is it going to get bigger? And we needed some honesty. We needed, we needed a you have a big nose moment there. <laughs> and if not, if not from BP, because it is hard to say that kind of thing to yourself, then maybe from one of our regulatory agencies. And for those of you who are covering what was going on in the States, then maybe you heard that one American politician actually apologized to BP and uh, insisted that they set up something to deal with the crisis. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, they, they apologized for the fact that they had to set up a relief fund to deal with the crisis. What are the implications of honesty? What good does it do? So sure, you know, you can admit there's a lot of oil leaked. But being honest about the problems not just gives us the truth, it also motivates people to act. If we know what the problem is, if we know how huge it is, then we're going to go there and solve it instead of just running away and trying to cover up. And from what we've seen so far, maybe it's not surprising that one of the quickest responders to the gold spill was not an adult at all, but a kid. 
Olivia Bowler, when she heard about the spill, was so touched that she decided to donate her hand-drawn uh, drawings to those who donated money to the Audubon Society's emergency fund for birds uh, that caught in the spill. AOL then donated $25,000, and she raised, uh, I think, hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even close to a million, just to help the wildlife. And Olivia is a good example, not just of empathy, but also of honesty and the motivation to act. When you see a problem, you should solve it, not dilly-dally for the sake of company brand or your PR. Disney spent close to $100 million on advertising alone, according to CNN Money. And this, when I look at this, I think, okay, you know, you can do a little advertising, but this is money that could have gone to fishermen or people affected by the Gulf spill. It was delaying action to tackle the problem like putting a band-aid on a wound instead of actually cleaning it out. And one thing that many people criticized the media officials for, notably Tony Hayward, who said that he wanted his life back, was the lack of empathy for both the animal and human populations, those who were affected by the Gulf spill. And I want to make it clear that I'm not blaming the workers at BP who may have had nothing to do with this bill whatsoever, just the reaction of some of their management. It was the aftermath and the response that irked a lot of people, and not just around the Gulf states, but around the US. Something officials like Tony Hayward, who is, I was now in exile in Siberia, I <laughs> nothing. Um, but something you could learn, and the heads of companies all around the world could learn, is that truly it shouldn't just be about the message that your company or how your company looks or the money that you're getting, but rather the impact that your organization has on the world. Is it negative? Is it positive? If it's negative, then it's obviously time to make a change. Has anyone here heard of the term cause market? Or even have you heard of cause market? <coughs> See a couple of raised hands. Well, um, cause marketing has become a fairly common marketing practice, and it's where companies will donate money to causes or foundations, or, or perhaps set up on their own foundations, um, in order to, well, it, for one thing, it improves their PR, but it's also uh, getting people to say, you know, this company is pretty good. Um, and so, for instance, the American retail chain Target donates, I think it's five percent, might be more, a percentage of their profits to schools uh, to help them. And while I'm always thrilled to see companies doing good, I think it's a wonderful way to help the world, I have to be skeptical sometimes. I have to ask, is this more for helping the world, or is it to improve your PR? And if it's to improve your PR, then it definitely works, because I know I bought products with chocolate bars that say they help animal sanctuaries. Um, but I have to see this as a lack of pure motivation to take care of our world. If you think if there was no positive PR associated with it, if there was no profit increase, how many companies would still continue their cost market? It's a hypothetical question. I mean, a lot of companies might still do it. It's possible that they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, but I wanted to quote the infamous Tony Hayward again. He said, our primary purpose in life is to create value for our shareholders. Perhaps some companies look at social responsibility and taking care of the world as a means to an end. More money, bigger profit margins, better PR. I would argue that money is merely a means and that helping the world should be our the goal. Google's informal company slogan is don't be evil. I think they have a more formal version of that. But have we really sunk so low that not being evil is our high standard of business? <laughs> this is a little picture I have. The truth is not being evil just isn't good enough anymore. We've gone past child labor and all these you know, evil practices, I hope anyway. And I think that we really need to start thinking not just about not being evil, but making it our goal to do good. Admittedly, I have a vested interest. My generation is going to be taking care of the world in a few decades or so. And, but even those of you who may not be around for another 70, 80 years can still follow this example of doing good first. I wrote a post on my blog on this very topic called Academia versus Business. If the clicker will move to my next slide. Here we go. So I'm going to read some of it. Um, and it, it is. It was after the, it was right after the oil spill, um, and uh, about that time. So this is the post. I've always wanted to go into education for many reasons, having an influence on the next generation, the fulfillment one gets out of teaching, etc. But another, perhaps less conscious reason, might be how very unbusinessy the academic sector is. Of course, there are big egos, giant ambitions, and plenty of politics. But at least there's one thing you can be sure of: with most people who work in the public sector, they're not in it for the money, or at least the good ones aren't. As a case in point, take a look at the average yearly teacher salary. It's in the measly range of $30,000 to $40,000 varying across school districts. Who in their right mind would accept 24-7 work with a bunch of customers who may not particularly want what you're selling? <laughs> on the other hand, the profit margins in business can be huge. Take a look at what some of those bankers on Wall Street are making. 
Tony Hayward, CEO of BP, has now become infamous for his many gaps, including a speech he gave to Stanford business students pre-spill, where he said he had too many people that were working to save the world, and he lost track of the fact that our primary purpose in life is to create value for our shareholders. This quote, to me, sums up all that is wrong with business. Too many don't establish their companies to make the world a better place. They establish it to make money, and in the case of BP, they make the world worse off in the process. When you found an organization to help the world, it's usually called a charity, not a business. You know that someone is really dedicated to helping the world when they don't make any money off of it. That said, nonprofits and government don't provide perfect examples either. Indeed, it seems like they've taken the worst from both worlds of private and public. Take the oft criticized minerals management service for an example. From what I hear, many of its employees have been hired from oil companies, the companies the MMS should be cracking down on, not hiring them. Like those who go into business, too many go into government for the three P's, power, prestige, and profit, as opposed to working to save the world, which is what they should be doing in the first place. When government and business interact, it seems to be good for everyone, everyone that is except for the average American citizen. What am I talking about? One word, lobbying. The unfortunate stranglehold the big industry has on the government's neck needs to loosen or fall away altogether. People complain about nothing being done to the halls of government, maybe because there are too many profit, prestige, power-driven people walking around in them. At the same time, governments and charities could learn a lot from the sleek efficiency that is the private sector's trademark. Visit some government office and try to get signed up. Hurrah, guess what, there's a form for that, which will no doubt be processed, faxed, signed, faxed, back, processed, stamped, you get the idea, in a process that will take several days, several weeks, several months, uh, or even in really bad cases, several years. There are many areas of government which have improved their efficiency, but many, such as the overwhelmed Veterans Affairs offices, still have a long way to go. Am I some anti-business, socialist, anti-American? Boy, I can hear the talk radio hosts having a field day already. No, I believe that business is important. Companies can have wonderful impacts in their communities. However, too often these impacts happen as part of marketing campaigns or as coincidences, and I look forward to a day where people don't start a company because they want to make gazillions in profits or sell some new thing or product or create value for their shareholders. I look forward to a day where those things are merely side effects, when Tony Hayward is the exception, not the norm, and where saving the world becomes not a mere distraction but our biggest goal. Obviously, as you can tell from my references throughout the speech, I did write that with an American audience in mind. It was right after BP, and I was fairly angry. <laughs> and, uh, however, I think that some of the same things that I mentioned in the post apply to Canada, too. And one of the comments that struck out most to me was one from a Canadian. I met Evelyn Chu in Toronto, and we were at the Idea City Conference, and she had written her comment before we met, and she said, Adora, you basically took the words out of my mouth. For the reasons you have mentioned, I have recently taken a different turn in my career. I was a business school graduate and worked in product management for two years upon graduation, but recently I have resigned from my position in the corporate world and will be obtaining my Bachelor of Education this coming August in hopes of one day being in the classroom. The main reason for my switch was exactly what you have said in this post, the lack of purpose or impact I felt that I was having on people and society as a whole. I commend you on your aspirations to change the world. Evelyn's comment really resonated with me. And this is not to say that businesses have no impact or negative impacts, but I find it really important that people like Evelyn feel like the work that they're doing is valuable and is having an impact on the world. Our world functions on many levels because of business, the goods and services that they offer. Uh, and some companies offer scholarship programs, internships, apprenticeships. Most large companies have foundations and charity matching programs or their day of volunteerism. But we have to ask, is that enough? When you look at philanthropy from magnets and industries throughout history, the accepted track has always been get rich. Don't care how you do that, just get rich. Okay, the child gave a picture with a little bit. A little bit, yes, but a buy a large house and or yacht, penthouse apartment, car, servants, beach house, summer house, etc. Optional, marry several times, preferably to former supermodels, <laughs> divorce several times, have a couple of children to inherit the wealth, and then donate a percentage of wealth to charity. <coughs> As we can see, the tradition is being passed along quite well. And don't get me wrong, I'm not grudging any of you a nice house or car. I think you deserve the fruits of your labors. And I am a big fan of the work that things like the Gates Foundation does, and without things like the Nobel Prize uh, or, or Warren Buffett's donations, um, you know, these, our world has definitely benefited a lot from these charitable works. Um, but I like the fact that there are some kids out there who are trying to change this model. They're putting Part D before Part A and Get Rich Part. They're helping the world just because they want to. Amia Alexander of Detroit, Michigan is a good case in point. Think back to what you got your nieces, nephews, grand grandsons, kids um, for Christmas or their birthdays last year. Was it video games, clothing, a good book? 
Whatever it was, I'm betting, unless you're me, Alexander's mom, there wasn't a pink bus. Not a toy pink bus, it was actually a life-size pink bus. And more than that, it was the start of Amiya's dream and her business. Amiya runs a mobile dance bus where she offers low-cost dance lessons or free uh, to students around the Detroit area. Um, and the reason that she offers these lessons to other kids is because she wants to combat the obesity that she sees in her community. She's done great work to help others, and so now she's saving up the money that she's making on that project and saving up for Harvard Medical School. And there are examples of kids and young people who have even bypassed the get rich part entirely. Two Canadians you may have heard of, Yuval Rajan and Craig Kielberger, provide such examples. Yuval Rajan uh, started his charitable work by selling Clementine oranges door to door to raise money for people affected by flooding in India. And he has raised um, so much that UNICEF Canada made him their official spokesperson. And he personally raised $50,000 to help those affected by the Southeast Asian tsunami. And uh, then when he did that, the Toronto District School Board gave you all the president and CEO of New South Canada with a check for $1.3 million. So the government of Canada then matched that and it made his donation nearly $4 million. Great fundraiser. <laughs> and then Craig Kielberger is now in his 20s, but when the Torontonian was 12, he read in a newspaper about the murder of the child labor and activist Ifo Masi. And Craig then decided to set up his own nonprofit, Free the Children, which today works on child labor worldwide. And Free the Children has expanded and started his own social enterprise or a uh, business to do good called Me to We, which donates half its annual profits on an annual basis to Free the Children by selling organic and fair trade clothing. So as you can see, these kids bypass the traditional business model by starting off with the save the world part first. And unless you're incredibly cynical, I think that we can agree that they probably didn't have money in mind when they started their organizations. Perhaps when you all were John started selling those Clementine oranges door to door, or Craig Kielberger founded Free the Children, they didn't stop and consider, man, this is going to be difficult, there's going to be challenges ahead. And I think that we can all learn from that fearlessness. There are many adults who have started nonprofits, a lot of adults who run charities, and I'm not saying that just kids do. But how many of you have simply read a newspaper article or started selling tangerines, and that's uh, right then to help the world, and that's where you start? The courage it takes to set out on ventures when you can't be sure of the outcome is courage that we don't see enough. We need, we need more of it. Just think of a time you've had an idea. It might have been a very good idea, manageable idea, and you struck down with that dagger, there's no way that'll happen. That's a very murderous. Uh, phrase. And over time, we get used to hearing those words and we begin to believe them. <laughs> Obviously, no one bothered to tell there's no way that'll happen with Lillian Camp Plumba. So, maybe some of you have heard of him, but here's a riddle. What can you make with blue gum trees, old bikes, and scrap metal? Well, if you're Lillian Camp Plumba, then that equals a wind turbine. I think there's something seriously wrong with that equation, but it's apparently possible. Uh, because when his family could no longer pay tuition for him to go to school, he read up about electricity in his local library, and he put together a wind turbine, as you can see here, from those very materials, and brought electricity to his village. It sounds like a fairy tale. Um, and there's no way I would be able to do that, so I'm already striking down my idea. But he was able to do that. We, many of us have read about something, but did we go out and just put something together like that? William did. While we might call the idea that you could light up a village with scrap metal kind of irrational, we might say, as a matter of fact, as I did, there's no way that'll happen. It's important to realize that beginnings, irrational or not, can lead to great things. When I spoke at the TED conference in Long Beach, then uh, I, I spoke about this, and one of the things I was tweeted most about was this idea, the world needs irrational thinking. I got a lot of attention for how striking this idea was. After all, you might say that it's irrational thinking that's got us into a lot of problems in the first place. I would argue that you need to fight fire with fire. We are in a world of unprecedented challenges from global warming to religious extremism to uh, armed conflict over resources. I mean, this is a world with problems uh, and, and really many things that threaten us. And you might say, hey, this is irrational thinking at work. But I would say that desperate times call for desperate thinking. Thinking that a preteen girl, a pink bus, and a Christmas wish could get kids moving is kind of irrational. And tangerines helping flood victims is irrational. And uh, reading a newspaper article sparking the idea that a 12-year-old could end child labor, that's irrational. Building a turbine out of scrap metal and old bikes, also irrational. 
But the idea that kids are deprived of fitness opportunities, or that a village is without electricity, or that people are without access to food and shelter, or children forced into labor against their will, that is unacceptable. This is a case where adults learning from kids doesn't just help us, it helps the world. Perhaps the same irrationality that helped Amiya, uh, Buah, Craig, and William, who would have thought they would help others with these simple things, these irrational ideas, this can be construed positively as creativity and resourcefulness. When I spoke at TED, I mentioned the, um, the Tacoma Glass Museum, which I encourage everyone to visit if you're ever in Washington State, just plugging them. Um, and they have a program called Kids Design Glass, which I also mentioned at TED. And that was where kids would get together and they would design their own glass art, and whoever did the best would be selected in the contest. And glass blowers said, you know, this is some of the hardest stuff that we've shaped, because kids don't realize how hard it is to blow glass in certain shapes. When we design stuff, we think about, OK, this is going to be difficult. Um, but the kids don't think about that. They just come up with good ideas. And that's the kind of creativity and irrationality that can not only give us interesting artworks, but can also give us new medicines, new inventions, and ultimately new innovations. Innovation, creativity, and sometimes maybe irrationality can provide the fuel for the engine of progress. Kids can be brimming with interesting, creative ideas. We just need an outlet. For me, that outlet was writing. For others, like my sister, who you heard, it might be music. For countless others, it could be science, math, art, or any other area. Creativity is directly tied in with resourcefulness. What can we make out of the things that we have? Maybe you don't think this is super important right now. Well, I would ask you, what kind of employee would you want to have? One, someone who's resourceful and who can make the most out of any situation, or someone who can only do what they're ordered to do uh, by step-by-step -step instructions. If you own McDonald's, uh, then number two is perfectly fine, but otherwise, <laughs> I think that, unfortunately, we're raising kids to be number two. We're raising our kids to be McDonald's workers or to, you know, put things together from step-by-step -step instructions. Growing up today, we live in a world that's just saturated with passive activities. And I mean, I, I watch TV when I was little, and that's fine. I think everything's fine in moderation. But a lot of times, kids growing up today, some of the only fun they have is in front of a screen. My sister and I often contrast our baby and early childhood to my cousin Maya's. We didn't have the most fashionable, awesome toys. I mean, we had some pretty good toys, but, but nothing like super, super fancy. Organic clothes or way too many jumperoos, bouncers, cradles, and swinging lullaby thingies that we could use. But honestly, I don't necessarily envy all of that. You see, my sister and I had a few very important ingredients. We had wooden blocks, we had styrofoam, we had the great outdoors, and most importantly, we had our imagination. With these rather unconventional toys, we would put together all kinds of things. We put together boarding houses and castles on our garage floor. My sister would uh, take some of the covers out of my room, it's never burned, and dress me up as a mummy, and uh, we would do stuff outside using leaves as currency, we would even uh, recycle envelopes. You can see the little plastic window there and make them into crowns and pretend that we were princesses. My parents didn't restrict us, didn't tell us that we couldn't drag the blankets out of our room or take the chairs out of the dining room to make a fort in the living room. They didn't even stop us when we doused our arms in mud and pretended to be gorillas. We had room for creativity. And without knowing it, my sister and I were utilizing that creativity to an extent that would no doubt help us in later life. But obviously we didn't think about that then. We were just too busy getting knee-deep in these man-made, well, kid-made mud canals. My efforts to get adults to listen and learn from kids, it's not just about my love of childhood mud sculpture. A big part of it, fancy as this may sound, a larger part of my efforts to get kids uh, and adults working together is my belief in the essential tenets of democracy. Uh, and one of the essential tenets of democracy is that everyone should have a voice and a say. By including us in your conversations, you're not only getting us involved in issues that you care about and hearing ideas that you might otherwise not hear, you're also making us more motivated to become involved. Uh, and when was the last time that you got involved in something that no one wanted you in, that you didn't really care about? A good example comes from Priya, who I mentioned her earlier. She was a board member for my planning committee for TEDx Redmond. And she uh, recently became involved with her city's Parks and Trails Commission. You might think, okay, parks and trails, it's like important, you know, I go for a walk in the park occasion, but probably not too many of you take a real everyday interest in, here's the new park, here's the new development. Uh, but once we had joined this committee, then she started really becoming involved in these issues, which the rest of us might think were kind of boring. On the slightly older side of youth, one of the perennial challenges of campaigns is getting young people out to vote. I'm not sure how much it is the same in Canada. This is 
again, um, showing my ignorance as an American, but um, one of the perennial struggles of political campaigns is getting young people out to vote, or at least in the US. Um, and whether it's because the politicians seem too geriatric or the issues don't seem to affect them, whatever it is, um, you know, uh, there are many different possibilities, but whatever it is that keeps the under 25 crowd from turning out, Barack Obama's campaign seemed to find a magic bullet to fight it. You might have followed this on the news, I'm not sure uh, how involved uh, you guys were in seeing this, but by getting so many young people involved in their campaign, even some young people not old enough to vote, like middle or high school age, then Obama's campaign was able to spark momentum around the nation. When it comes to traditional forms of power, then the middle-aged group definitely has an advantage. But in the campaign in the general election, young people made their voice heard through their vote. The sheer numbers of young people who turned out helped to bring Obama to the White House. And his campaign was wildly successful, not just because of social media outreach, uh, or voting strategizing, or a nation that was tied to the Bush administration. It was because, or at least in large part, because it was one of the few campaigns that really listened to young people, got them involved, got them to call people and knock on doors. And as I talked about, we were included, we get involved. There are already some programs trying to get kids involved, uh, at least on surface level, by providing tech support for their teachers. Um, I know like Generation Yes, Mouse Squad in, in the United States. Um, and I think that long before such programs have existed in schools, getting kids to provide tech support, then the home tech support program has been around. Raise your hand if you've ever asked your children, grandchildren, niece, nephew, to help you with this technology. <laughs> I see some raised hands. This is an example that it worked. I know that my mom has definitely asked me for help on her iPhone, figuring out certain apps. Um, and what I'm getting from this is it's absolutely fine for us to help fix technology and teach you how to use email or whatever it is. Actually, I probably don't use email, but, um, but when it comes to making a decision and having a voice, it's a different story. Maybe this isn't entirely uh, to blame adults for. If they went through the same thing as a kid, then they might think, well, now it's my turn to be listened to. Why do I have to still listen and be upstaged by someone who can't wait their turn? However, to me, having the opportunities to share ideas shouldn't be something that comes like uh, trying to check out at this, the, the grocery store or waiting in a long line at, Dis at Disneyland. It should be something that comes whenever uh, and wherever you want it. And it should be available to everyone, no matter what your age. Obviously, brilliant ideas aren't exclusive to youth. I've learned a lot over the years from being included in adults' conversations, and just recently when uh, Alan King was driving us around, he was being an excellent tour guide of uh, Calgary. We got to see so much, and he, he told us about a lot of things, and we learned a lot from him. Um, and I think that that's a great example of where listening to adults definitely has helped me, because I've been in so many conversations. Um, and when you think about it, the best relationships are reciprocal. When was the last good friendship you had with someone who never wanted to know what you thought? Though adult society's interaction with kids must focus on discipline and cooperation, it's also very valuable and very important to focus on the importance of reciprocal learning, respect, and collaboration. <coughs> it's easier to listen to someone when they listen to you. When I feel respected, I'm more likely to return the feeling. I uh, held that TEDx event, or an independently organized TED event, with all of you from the audience. All youth organizing and all youth speaking. We turn the tables and set the adults off to a sign cast room. And most companies might be a little scared or possibly contentious at the idea of a bunch of kids uh, running around, sponsoring a bunch of kids running this conference. But two companies, Generation Yes and Microsoft's Bing, uh, had that trust in me and my committee from the beginning. And I find it really heartening when the Microsoft Conference Center, this big corporate, you know, um, fancy convention center, lets a bunch of kids run all over the place without batting an eye. And that trust meant a lot to me. While you may not necessarily be devoting from this conference center to your kids' conference, although it's certainly a noble goal, every one of you in the audience today can think. Instead of always demanding you listen to me, maybe it's time that you also started listening to us. Raise your hand if you have any youth on an advisory board or in volunteer positions in your company. I see the couple raised hands. A few, okay. So not, not a majority of the audience. I'm very glad you guys raised your hands. That's um, a wonderful idea. So that's an example of the ideal adult response. The I ideal adult response is adults taking kids seriously. I mean, for those of you who work, for instance, in uh, marketing to teens or to kids, that's we're one of the biggest demographics. Um, but <coughs> what is the reality of the adult response? It depends. 
Um, some of us are lucky to grow up in homes with great, supportive families who ask us questions and listen to what we think. Um, but if you're not lucky, if you're not one of the Olivia's, Amia's, Lulls, Craig's, Williams, Adora's, and Adrian's out there, then it may be be quiet, that's stupid, don't touch that, go away. And that's what's preventing adults from learning from kids. I mean, just try to have a conversation with someone who puts their hand over your mouth and <coughs> I was thinking of doing a turn to your neighbor kind of thing, but I thought that would be a little too uh, hands-on. Too many kids, though, have to face this challenge because of the metaphorical hands over mouths. The restrictions on the parts of adults um, and possibly our schools and our societies. Too many adults don't bother to include you, even on issues which affect us directly. I understand that you don't ask the kid every time you're going to make a change to the sewer system or something like that, but education is something that affects all of us. At TEDx Redmond, I asked the kids, raise your hand if you go to school. It was unanimous. We all go to school. We all sit in those classroom chairs every day. And yet, our voice too often is not being heard. Above the voice of the teacher, the government official, I think that the voice of the student can provide some of the clearest insights of all. Who sits in those chairs and hears the lessons and eats lunch in the cafeteria every day? Surely we should have a say in how those lessons are taught, the kind of food we eat. And yet, not at all. Maybe one of the reasons that students complain that school is boring is because we're not involved enough. When we're included, we get involved, and we're not included. When I go to education conferences, I hardly ever see other students there. At the Florida Education Technology Conference that I went to last year, uh, then they actually had to get a special official to escort me onto the floor because their insurance does not cover kids. That's how rare it is for a kid to be at an education conference, which should be serving them. You might think that with examples of so many talented youth out there, the schools would jump at the chance at having these star students to uh, have them at the drawing board and to have them uh, come and share their insights with adults. But one of my speakers at TEDx Redmond described his challenge. Despite having founded a company, written a book, donated proceeds to charity, his school didn't even want him to speak to fellow students. No, they said that if they made him special, then they'd have to make every other student special. I see authors, business leaders, sports stars holding uh, assemblies with students. Is a sports star more relevant to students than a, uh, than a peer who's done something great is? This kind of stonewalling from schools when it comes to having examples of youth achievement, having uh, youth on the drawing board, is not just, you know, it's not just stopping them from learning from us, it's also stopping us from getting involved. And it's really paradoxical. On one hand, you tell kids to get involved in their community, go out there, do great work, make a difference, and then you don't let them have a voice in your school. Sometimes the restrictions can be indirect. I heard a story from a math teacher in Boston who told me that at his school, there were many classrooms where the teachers were scared of technology, they didn't want the kids to be using it, and this is technology that the students were supposed to use, and they would put blue tape around the technology that said, stay away. Such roadblocks when it comes to trusting kids, giving us responsibility and a voice, are roadblocks when it comes to learning from us, too. I would ask, why this prevalently restrictive attitude? Our bodies are growing, so why don't our dreams and what we want to do? As we grow taller, we want to climb higher, go further, dive deeper in life. And yet, when the average kid says that they want to do more than sleep, study, socialize, perhaps start their own business or publish a book, a lot of adults will say, you yeah, wait until you're older. You may have noticed it's not what are you doing right now, it's what do you want to do when you grow up. The problem with this is that our dreams are not in suspended animation. Uh, one poem, A Dream Deferred by Langston Hughes, expresses this quite eloquently. He said, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it?